All right, well, welcome. Thank you guys for coming this morning to our climate change debate. So how we're going to do this today is that Professor Farley and Dr. Hatkoff are our debaters. I'm going to pose a series of three questions to them, okay, one question at a time. They'll each have an opportunity to respond. They're going to alternate on who gets to go first on the response. They'll be given two minutes to respond to the question. The other debater will have three minutes to respond back. And then the first person that responded will have one minute to rebut what the original debater said. After that, we'll give you guys five to ten minutes to get your thoughts together because I want you to pose two questions. It can be to one or both of our debaters. One can be a question about climate change in general, and then I would like one question to be something specific that they said, that you, that you asked the question about, okay? And then after that, they'll give us their closing statements, and then we'll have an open discussion about today's activity and why we did this today, okay? So we're going to start with opening statements from each speaker. They're given five minutes. Professor Farley, your opening statements. Well, good morning. Thanks, y'all, for being here. Uh, my name is Greg Farley. I'm also a member of the science faculty. And uh, lately, my career has taken a turn towards kind of being our, our campus sustainability person. I refer to myself in public as the crazy green ideas person for Chesapeake College. Um, like most scientists of my generation, I have found it necessary to become well-versed in the science of climate change because it was my generation of scientists that started seeing the fingerprints of climate change first. Um, and I want to start with a couple of stories. Uh, we started seeing climate change impacts on invertebrate studies in the Gulf of Mexico when I was in grad school in the 90s because uh, at some point a bunch of us went out for a field survey of a particular organism we had read the literature, we knew when and where the organism was supposed to be, we showed up and we missed it. The organism had come and gone early. We saw changes in ocean pH, changes in seasonality, much higher summer and winter temperatures in the water. Um, these things all sort of made our generation stand up and take notice that we could no longer ignore this. This was not just a problem for geoplanetary physicist guys, this was a problem for all of science. Um, closer to home then, here in the Chesapeake Bay, I also have a friend here on the faculty. Uh, yeah, how many of you had Dr. Harper for English? Yeah, he, his family owns a, a farmstead on the Choptank River out in Caroline County. And they had the property surveyed at some point, twice in a five year period. And they had lost three inches in elevation over the course of that five years. Three inches. That implies the sea came up three inches. The sea level rise had accelerated. Now let's be generous and let's assume that half of that is human error. We do make mistakes. Even so, an inch and a half over a five year period ought to be enough to make you stand up and take notice. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to argue from basic facts. I'm going to try and get you up to speed on the basic science and then some of the modeling and then some of the evidence that shows us that climate change is real that it is driven by human forces, and that it is happening, and that we can do something about it. So, in the time I have remaining to me, this is the basic mechanism behind all of climate change. Carbon dioxide is a covalently bonded molecule, and it, it absorbs infrared heat energy from the sun, captures a little bit of it, releases others. The problem is not that carbon dioxide does this. Carbon dioxide has done this since the beginning of the planet. We have good evidence from the rock record that our atmosphere used to be almost entirely carbon dioxide. The problem is, over the course of human history, and we're starting here at about 1750, this is the carbon dioxide level on this axis, and you can see that especially since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, that we've been slowly pouring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at an ever-increasing rate. And so, over the long run, if you look at the, the, the ice core record, if you look at the tree ring record, it really doesn't matter where you, where you measure it, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere seems to vary on natural cycles between about 180 and 300 parts per million. And really the number is closer to 180 to about 280 parts per million. We've added so much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere 
that we're today at about 410 parts per million. We have increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by over 100 parts per million over the running average. You can stretch this all the way back to the 800,000 year point if you care to take the data. We know carbon dioxide causes warming. We can measure that in the laboratory and show that to you. So does methane, so does nitrous oxide, so does some of the halocarbons, right? So does black carbon on snow, soot, right? There are other forcing mechanisms that are helping cool the globe. Some things like clouds and snow and polar ice caps reflect heat back out to the surface. But by and large, our atmosphere is responsible for warming. In fact, that's a good thing. We would probably be too cold without our current atmosphere. We know that this works from evidence from other planets. Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect and is probably some 400 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it should otherwise be given its proximity to the sun. Mars has almost no atmosphere and almost no temperature. It's about the same temperature as space itself. So we know that carbon dioxide does this. We know we are adding carbon dioxide to the record. Um, and I can tell you, it doesn't matter where you measure it. The data on this graph run the gamut. Some of them are from ice cores. Some of them are from uh, stalactites and stalagmites in caves. Some of them are from coral reefs. Some of them are from lake bottom sediments in tropical and polar lakes. Some of them are from sand dunes. It doesn't matter where you measure it from. The long-term temperature record and carbon dioxide record is relatively stable until we start adding this stuff to the atmosphere. And that is why the planet is warming. My opponent will argue that none of this is real, that it's all natural cycles, that it's all about the sun, that it's all about some other interestingly very closely chosen factoids from the data sets. He's going to present individual data points as though they are trends. He's going to present arguments that it's really all a conspiracy, that this is, this is called an ad hominem argument. He's going to present the idea that this is liberal scientists. He probably will call me a liberal scientist, lining their pockets. He will try to get you to uh, endorse conspiracy theories. Uh, he will probably try and distort the data that he does have in irresponsible ways. And he'll try and get you to believe that scientists don't believe this. I humbly submit to you, this is not a matter for belief. This is a matter of reading the data and accepting it. The basic science tells us this is happening, we can measure it, it's real, it's our fault, and we can do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Farley. Dr. Hackoff, your opening <coughs> statement. All right. So my name is Dr. Matthew Ryan Hackoff. I have five years of experience getting my PhD, three years of research experience at the University of California, Los Angeles, and two years of teaching experience here at Chesapeake College, and I'm here to tell you that my liberal friend is completely wrong. He is full of malarkey. Basically, he has taken the government's fundings and spun it around to basically make you worried about tomorrow. All of the global warming phenomena that we're seeing, if it is even happening, can be attributed to hard science and natural cycles. These are all facts that you could look up on Google right now as you sit in the audience. The Earth has an axial tilt. We all know this. We're about to go into the summer season. In the summer, the northern hemisphere where we are is facing towards the sun. We absorb more heat from the sun, more radiation. The planet warms. The other half of the year, we are facing away from the sun, tilted back. We're absorbing less energy, thus it is colder. So the axial tilt, we can all feel it. It influences the temperature we experience on a daily basis. Another fact that you can look up very easily, the sun has a natural cycle. It runs on an 11 year cycle of solar maximum and solar minimum, and that correlates with the amount of sunspots. More sunspots, solar maximum, more energy. More energy, more heat, warmer planet. Less energy, less heat, cooler planet. Not long ago, Professor Farley was showing you things all the way back, three, four hundred thousand years ago. I'm going to take you back a little bit. 1816, known as the year without a summer. It was so cold in 1816 that it snowed in England in June. There was frost in New England in July. It was cold down the mid-Atlantic. There was no growing season. This planet actually experienced a whole year without a summer. The culprit here that's on trial is carbon dioxide. 
Carbon dioxide is a natural product. Each and every one of you and everyone on this planet produce two pounds of carbon dioxide each and every single day. Would Professor Farley and the scientists have you stop breathing to stop producing carbon dioxide? Is that what it's going to take to save this planet? And if carbon dioxide was so bad, why would evolution have selected for it? Why would we be exhaling carbon dioxide more than that? Why would plants be using it? Carbon dioxide is what plants need to sustain photosynthesis. Photosynthesis produces all of the food we see on Earth. Without photosynthesis, life on Earth would simply stop. Professor Farley is going to throw a whole bunch of things at you about it. it's getting warmer. You know, it's, we're not going to be able to sustain these temperatures. Well, I can tell you with 100% certainty, this planet has been this warm before. It's been four degrees warmer before. It's been four degrees colder before. The planet has seen these fluctuations. This is nothing that has not happened before. These are natural phenomena that simply cycle in a natural pattern. And I ask you to look at some of the facts that was presented to you. Professor Farley showed temperatures from 300,000 years ago? Yes, sir. Did they have thermometers 300,000 years ago? How do they know what those temperatures were? How do you accurately measure a temperature from a point when there was nobody around to measure it? He told some very nice stories about an inch and a half, up to three inches of land being lost. What if, what if there was a wave coming in, you know? What if, what if something else had happened there that, that the scientists hadn't accounted for? And there was the nice story about going to look for fish in a nice, probably a big yacht that the government was paying for to go look at just studying, you know, your pet project there. And I say, well, what if you just had the dates wrong? What if you had just been a little off and then you had missed it on your own and it had nothing to do with climate change, it had nothing to do with carbon dioxide, it had nothing to do with the complicated, overly sensationalized claims that my friend here is going to make. Everything today can be attributed to natural cycles that this planet has been experiencing for its entire life. Thank you, Dr. Hatkoff. Gentlemen, <clears throat> we will now start our questions. First question, and Dr. Hatkoff, you will have the first opportunity to respond. What are the principal lines of evidence supporting your position? That is a great question. One of the most important lines of evidence that I have is that scientists, the scientific community, the people that we are supposed to trust, cannot agree on climate change. There is a disagreement among scientists. Professor Farley would want to basically say, oh, no, don't, don't, don't worry about it. But you can turn on any cable news network, turn on Fox News, turn on CNN, turn on MSNBC, turn on any of those networks, and you will see them talking about climate change. And what you will see on those networks is one scientist who firmly believes climate change is man-made and is happening, and one scientist who believes that it is not happening. They're basically showing you a snapshot of the scientific community there. If you look a couple weeks ago, if we were lucky enough to have this earlier on when it was supposed to be spring, you would notice it was freezing cold outside. It wasn't hot out, it was cold out. There are natural fluctuations. Had this been at the beginning of the semester, I could have taken a snowball, brought it in here, plopped it right down on Professor Farley's desk here and said, there, there's the snow. How can global warming be happening if it is snowing outside? I then want you to turn your attention to the year 1977, recent human history, and look at the periodical Time magazine. Not a tabloid, a magazine that we would think is trustworthy. And you can look at the cover from 1977 and it says, the next ice age is coming. Not the planet's heating up, it's cooling down. So it was not long ago that our scientist friends over here thought that we weren't going into a period of global warming, we were actually going into a period of global cooling. Thank you, Dr. Heitkopf. Professor Farley, your response. Well, that's a lot to unpack, isn't it? 
Let's start with a, let's start with the idea that it has been this warm before because my esteemed colleague is absolutely right. The globe has been warmer before. In fact, when the earth was first formed, the forces of radioactive decay from elements collected from the explosion that caused our sun uh, it caused it to be incredibly hot. In fact, we call that period in the, in the rock record the Hadean period, like Hades, hot as hell, right? But let's examine it in a more realistic context. Let's say, well, let's find a space in the record where temperature has been higher than it is now. In fact, for much of the Earth's existence, temperature has been higher than it is now. This is 5.9 uh, billion years on this end. Right, and we're going to watch the carbon dioxide record come and go. Let's focus on this period right here when we have a really great warm spike here and a really great warm spike here. Any, anybody care to hazard a guess about what the dominant animals were in the Jurassic period? We don't call it Jurassic Park for nothing. This is a period of time that was not conducive to mammals. The fauna was ruled by large ectothermic dinosaurs. Our species arose probably at a convergence point of 6.5 million years from a common ancestor with other kinds of primates. Mammals, by and large, evolved in this period here. Our species is so recent, 6.5 million years probably occurs right about here on this graph. And you can see that our species is adapted to coexisting in ecosystems that, where temperatures are roughly what they are now. We, we simply have no experience as humanity with higher temperatures. And I suggest to you that adapting to that while technologically possible would be extremely expensive and extraordinarily difficult. Scientists do agree about this, despite the fact that my colleague over here will have you believe otherwise. This is a pie chart. It doesn't look like one, but it is. A survey of the literature between 2013 and 2014 identified 24,210 peer-reviewed published articles. Peer review is the meat grinder through which we put scientific ideas to make sure that they are sound, to make sure that the data has been collected well, to make sure the data has been handled well, and the analysis is statistically valid. Of those, four authors and five articles reject the idea that man-made global warming is happening. If those articles were important in the scientific sense, we should see that they are cited heavily. Those five articles in combination have one citation. It is a correction to one of the original five papers. This represents six thousandths of one percent of the scientific literature on climate change. And that's the difference between that and the Time article and the book underneath the Time article that my colleague is so fond of, of harping upon. The Time magazine article was a book review. The book was written by a single scientist. It is not peer reviewed. It was an attempt to understand early climate modeling using about as much computing power as your current toaster. And it represented a misappropriation of some ideas it was sensational, it caused a great big splash in the press, and it was not good science. Those ideas have been robustly debunked by the scientific community, um, and 20 years of research since 1977 says that, this is, that that idea was not only out of step now, it was probably out of step when it was published. Thank you, Professor Farley. We'll now start our Second question. Madam Moderator, I believe my, my, oh. my esteemed colleague gets a minute to rebut. He does. He does. My apologies, Dr. Hatkoff. You're trying rebuttal. to shut me down I'm on stage, to shut you the down liberal already. scientists. Your rebuttal, please. If that book was just a bunch of hokum, as the scientists want you to believe, why then were we in an ice age 12,000 years ago? That is an undeniable scientific fact. I have yet to hear an explanation that satisfies my brain to tell me why scientists also believed there was a pause in global warming in the late 20th century. I'd like, to, I'd like to give my last 30 seconds to Professor Farley to see if he can come up with the answers to those ones. <clears throat> Dr. Hadkoff, sir, if you are going to cite facts, get them correct. 
the last ice age in, on this continent and in Europe and Northern Asia ended 14,000 years ago, not 12,000 years, a significant amount of time for human civilization. The idea that there has been a global warming pause was an idea that we were investigating very actively in the scientific literature. Um, it has since been exposed as a, as a, a statistical artifact and if you go over the long-term record and you put that artifact back into the historical context, it simply becomes part of the rising trend. It was a coll uh, collusion of data between the, uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which masked some of the warming in the South Pacific, um, and a misunderstanding of some of what was going on in both the Antarctic and the Arctic above the Pacific Basin. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, now we can do our second question. My apologies. Okay, Professor Farley, you'll have the first response. The recent agreements by 102 nation, 192 nations in Paris represents a global effort to constrain warming to 2 degrees C. Why does 2 degrees matter? Brutally, 2 degrees C is a compromise. 2 degrees C leaves us with a world, the models tell us, that will at least be recognizable and in which human systems as we currently understand them, political systems, economic systems, social justice systems, migration systems, can continue to exist more or less in their current form. At 2 degrees C, we're not necessarily worried about famine because agriculture fails. We're not worried about famine because fisheries fail. 2 degrees C leaves us with a world to which the majority of humanity will be able to adapt with a minimum of impact. I'd like to sort of bring that home to the more regional scale. All right? Why does it matter to us here in the Chesapeake Bay Basin? Let's talk about our homes for a minute instead of this great big global thing. We know here in Maryland that 3 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 1.5 centigrade, is probably certain. We know that that's coming. If we stopped emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, momentum in the system, the physics already underway, are probably going to warm us about a degree and a half centigrade. We know that we're going to see greater changes in our summer period than in our winter period because, as my colleagues so nicely pointed out, that's when we're pointed towards the sun. If we continue with a business as usual trajectory for greenhouse gases and we choose not to mitigate our carbon dioxide creation, we could end up with summers that are 10, 9, 11 degrees warmer on average than we see right now and then we see in the historical record. What this translates to is more hot days. The number of 90 degree days right now floats right around oh, about a month, about 30 or so, right? About one month out of every year we have days over 90 degrees. Under a business as usual scenario, we will probably see something like 100 or maybe 120 90 degree days, that's three months out of the year. Under that same business as usual scenario, the number of 100 degree days would, would rise from about two and a half, maybe three, to somewhere between 25 and 35, an entire month of 100 degree days. This poses costs to human societies. The costs to open shelters, costs to public health, costs to try and help our elderly and our young, the weakest members of our society, survive these events. And to make matters worse, those of us who have air conditioning on these days simply crank it up. And that means we're producing more carbon dioxide to support more electricity, and we are simply making the problem worse. 2 degrees C also comes with an uncomfortable level of sea level rise. This is a map of my home in St. Michael's. The dark blue areas are expected to be regularly inundated. At 2 degrees C, we're looking at perhaps as many as 15 feet of sea level rise. If you move the slider on that bar closer to 4 degrees C, we start losing much of the, the Delmarva Peninsula, the Chesapeake Bay side of Route 50. Those are unconscionable consequences. They would entail economic losses, personal losses, community losses that we simply cannot deal with. Two degrees C is a compromise number that leaves our future relatively intact. Thank you, Professor Farley. Dr. Hatkoff, your response. So the question posed, why does two degrees C matter? It's a very loaded question, and I have a simple answer. It doesn't matter. It's an arbitrary number picked out by the world government. The 192 nations decided to pick a number out of thin air 
put it down on a piece of paper, and then say, okay, people, freak out about it, because guess what? We're going to supposedly be heading towards that. Again, we know this planet has been 2 degrees Celsius warmer. It has been 2 degrees Celsius colder. This is not a number that this planet has not seen before. So why should this be a number that we have to worry about? Ultimately, what this is, is a ploy by the world government to start imposing economic regulations on those 192 nations, which includes, as it stands today, the United States of America. Meaning we will not be able to regulate ourselves because they, we will have regulations imposed by us from that world government of 192 nations. One thing that you're going to hear my opponent bring up, and I'm sure it's coming very, very shortly, and he mentioned it. In fact, the 2 degrees C raises the sea level, and then 2 degrees C is going to increase ocean acidification. And I'm going to tell you, before he can even get to it, ocean acidification is not going to be a problem. Look out west. Look at the Great Salt Lake. It has a pH of 9. 9 is not acidic. 9 is basic. It is not changing there. We don't have to worry about the Great Salt Lake, which we all know is a much smaller body of water than the entire 70% of the planet that's oceans. So if the pH of the Great Salt Lake can't change, then the pH of the ocean surely can't change. And if the pH of the ocean can't change, there's a little sort of hole in the argument there. And then that 2 degree C mark seems even more absurd. Ultimately, what we're going to get into is the 2 degree C mark is a economic regulation that's going to lead to more hardship in each and every one of your lives. I'd like to begin by taking on the red herring argument that is the Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake re uh, retains its basic nature because of some underlying geology. It is an ab aberrant lake that doesn't behave in the same way that other freshwater systems do. But let's look at the data because that's what we do in science. What you're looking at here is the Keeling curve, direct measurement of carbon dioxide in the air at the most remote point on the planet that is farthest from any human habitation, farthest from any major industrial centers. This is Mauna Loa on Hawaii. If you look at the carbon dioxide record, it goes up. This green trend is ocean pH. We can measure changes in ocean pH and we can correlate them directly with carbon dioxide level. The carbonate buffer at the sea surface is responsible for absorbing most of the carbon dioxide that we introduce into the air. It has been what has kept us from runaway greenhouse warming for the past century. The economic impact of doing nothing would be catastrophic. And if you don't believe me, ask the insurance industry. The insurance industry is already stressed enough that they have stopped writing homeowners insurance policies in coastal regions up and down the, the east coast of the United States because they understand that the damages they are seeing are related to this climate induced risk. It is now impossible to get a homeowner's insurance policy in much of the Gulf Coast of Florida, particularly in low-lying regions. The same is true for the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and the same is beginning to be true for the Delmarva Peninsula. If you don't believe the insurance guys, go to the reinsurance industry. That's a massive financial industry that props up insurance companies when their claims exceed what money they have on hand to pay out. They are also getting out of climate reinsurance in certain markets because they perceive the risk to be unavoidable. Unfettered markets, markets that we don't regulate, don't serve society well. Regulation it reduces risk for businesses. Risk, if you are running a large enterprise, is bad. Risk, if you're running a small enterprise, is worse. Regulation gives you the certainty to, to level the playing field, to know which part of the playing field you're playing on, to know exactly where and how and when the rest of your competition is constrained so that we can uh, predict the behavior of your business going forward. That's not my arguments. That's Joseph Stiglitz, who won a Nobel Prize in economics. 
This idea that regulation uh, is bad for growth, is regulation is bad for people, and regulation is bad for industry is an inherently political talking point, but we are seeing the beginnings of breaks on this. This guy is Bob Inglis. He's a former member of the House of uh, United States House of Representatives from North Carolina. Um, he was a Tea Party Republican who studied the data for climate change and decided that the, the, the argument was over in his own mind, the data are enough to convince him to act. So he is beginning to use the power of markets to try and find solutions that work within that regulated environment. And as a Republican, he's not really very in favor of regulation. So even he sees the need for this. And finally, if you need somebody with you dyed in the wool conservative credentials to make you believe this is not a liberal conspiracy and that markets are taking notice, this is from the Risky Business Project, The Economic Risks of Climate Change in the United States, written by Henry Paulson, who was the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury under conservative President George W. Bush, and Michael Bloomberg, the former conservative mayor of New York City. Markets are taking notice. The data are inescapable. Regulation is a matter of implementation of sound science. How and when we regulate is a matter for public policy and it's a matter for debate and it's a conversation we should have. To simply argue that all regulation is bad would be to put us back to where we were in the late 1800s when coal miners died from coal accidents, when industrial accidents claimed in some industries as many as 10 or 12 percent of workers in a year. Um, we don't want to go back to that unregulated environment, I hereby propose. Thank you, Professor Farley. Dr. Hatkoff, let's continue along this line of thought that Professor, Harley, or Professor Farley introduced. What is the economic impact of doing nothing? Nothing itself. Regulations imposed by outside bodies, the 192 nations of the Paris Accords, are going to lead to nothing but hardship. Who here loves tax day? Who's like, oh yeah, I get to pay taxes. More taxes is going to be a fun day for me. I don't think there's going to be a single person in the country who's looking forward marking off April 15th as their happy day. <coughs> more regulations are going to lead to more taxes. That essentially means more taxes, less money in your paycheck, less money in your bank account, less food on your table, you, your friends, your family, going hungry, mealtime after mealtime after mealtime based on regulations imposed from this crazy science and this two degree warming mark that is arbitrarily chosen. Regulations are going to take away hard working Americans jobs. They are going to take the coal miners out of business. They are going to take the jobs away disproportionately from the blue collar everyday man and woman who's just trying to scrape by and is going to put it in the pockets of the scientists, of the Wall Street elites, and of the politicians who stand to benefit from these increased regulations. America is an industrial society. That's what we were built on. That's what we are good at. Our economy, Wall Street, stock markets, retirement funds are propped up by the major oil industries. If the scientists have their way, they're going to put the oil industry out of business and then everyone's going to lose their retirement fund. It's 2008 all over again. The stock market goes into a, a bubble and crashes and then again, not only are you paying more taxes and then all that money you work to save is just wiped off the face of the earth, all for our little friend carbon dioxide, which again has been around for all of human history. Thank you, Dr. Hatkoff. Professor Farley, would you like to respond? I would, because there's a number of things in there where I think my opponent is misleading you. Let's examine the idea that if we simply do nothing, we can, we can all eat better. Food is grown by plants. Some plants will be fine with increases in temperature and increases in uh, carbon dioxide level. Among those plants here on the Delmarva, Poison ivy. Poison ivy appears to really like high concentrations of carbon dioxide. It also appears to thrive in high temperatures. It's doing just fine in our hot summers. Crop plants are soybeans. They appear to be unaffected by this. So soybean yields don't appear to change. Globally, however, if you look at projections of American corn, the red line, as a function of temperature, we can tell you that that plant does not perform well under increased temperature scenarios. 
So we will begin to see our agricultural systems, the foundation of the food system, show signs of stress at elevated temperatures and elevated carbon dioxide levels. And that not only has repercussions for food, it also has repercussions for economics. Let's talk about the idea that regulations are bad for blue collar workers. Folks, I had family members in the coal mines in Pennsylvania. My wife's grandfather had black lung from an unregulated coal mine and had lost a leg to a mining accident. Regulations aren't necessarily bad for the little guy. What is bad for the little guy is when markets crash, our diminished resources are among the first to be hit. The one percenters will be fine. The top three percent guys, they'll be okay. Those of us who are struggling to make rent, pay a mortgage, try and keep cars on the road long after their useful lifespan is over, um, those are folks who get hurt by these things. And the idea is proposed that, especially for places where seas are going to rise, that anybody can just move. That this is America, we all have that opportunity. And that's true. But it's not an equal opportunity, is it? If you're a matter of member of the 1%, you can sell your waterfront estate and you can go on and you can take your profits from that sale and you can plow them into another enterprise. If you're a member of a low to moderate income community and you're relying on your neighbor here to take care of your child on Monday so you can go to a job and your neighbor here takes you in with them on Wednesdays because your car is somewhere else and your son and daughter are here on Thursday and Friday afternoon and this neighbor picks them up after school on Tuesdays, the first person to pull out of that community causes a collapse. It becomes very, very difficult for the community to heal from those wounds. And then when that person does pick up and go, corporeally, physically, they have the ability to get up and go. But do they have the economic ability to make sound living and live the fullest capacity of their lives wherever they end up being displaced? The history of that migration is that we don't see that. Thank you, Professor Farley. Okay, so that concludes the three question series of the debate. So now we're going to give you guys five to ten minutes to get your thoughts together and formulate your questions for our debaters. Let's give these guys a round of applause. 8 a.m. of doing this. Uh, I mean, it is definitively a politicized subject because many people, scientists, think it's happening. And many other people, like myself, think it is not happening. So I think what you ultimately see is two splits. You see a split between the people who think it's happening and people who think it's not happening. And then you see a split between those who think it's happening and then what to do about it. And I don't even really worry about what to do about it because it's not happening. Can I ask my second question straight away? Sure. Do you think that there's been a recent gag put on the EPA so they cannot speak and they cannot properly fund their studies? Is that something that so is the gag on the EPA a good thing or should we not even worry about it? And so I would say that just not worry about it. What, is, what does the environment need us to protect? How, how, what, what of the utmost hubris is that to think that the environment needs lowly humans to protect it? The environment will be okay. Professor Farley, would you like to rebut? I, I would like to address that. Um, the gag order at the EPA and the reduction in the scientific workforce at the EPA and the corresponding gag order on the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Administration and the reduction in that scientific workforce, uh, the proposal to eliminate the Sea Grant program and the reduction in that scientific workforce. Uh, this looks to a lot of us in the scientific community like a systematic effort to deny the problem. Uh, which to a lot of us appears a little bit like sticking your fingers in your ears and yelling la 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 la. Um, certainly things are changing while we're not watching and we know that. Um, and my other problem with that is that we have always been a scientific leader and uh, the globe recognizes the value of American science because of our processes and because of the way we go about peer review and the way we go about funding. If we withdraw from that leadership position other nations will step in and then we will lose the ability to lead the dialogue about what to do with it. My colleague is correct. There are sort of two splits. There's the acceptance denial split and then there's the do something, do nothing split even among people who do accept it. Um, that is a heavily politicized arena and as the politics play out, I think we risk both progress and leadership. 
Uh, um, and folks, just real quick, we are repeating the questions so that we can get them on video, right? So that's not, like, we're not trying to make fun of you or we're not trying to, you know, poke holes in what you're saying. Um, we're just trying to make sure that your question is well represented for the, the videotape portion. Next question. Um, this is for uh, Dr. Hackall. So I was wondering about the credibility of the Time Magazine article that you mentioned because Time itself in June of 2013 said that they did not predict the coming ice age and they and at the end the scientists itself said the reality of scientists in the 1970s were just beginning to understand how climate change affected global temperature. So why is your source credible? So why is the Time Magazine from 1977 credible after Time Magazine has come out with an essentially a retraction saying they were not predicting the future? Well, who's to say that in 2033, they won't retract what they said in 2017. <laughs> That's all I've got about that. Madam Moderator, a comment if I might? Absolutely. Um, this is one of the fundamental struggles, not only of climate science, but of all science, I think, for American media. Um, American media exists to sell a product. They exist to move ideas to you at cost. You had to buy that Time magazine. Right? This was before the days when you could even look it up. Um, and I suspect that the rebuttal in 2013 that disavows that prediction is all about selling magazines and selling copy. Um, scientific community in America has a great problem with the media because we tend to talk about things in probability. We use data, we use very careful statements, we show a lot of fancy slides, we talk in big words. Uh, we know this is an issue and we are trying to figure out how to get around that for ourselves. Uh, but in the meantime, the media on the other side has gone after simplicity and the appearance of debate where there isn't any because it simply sells magazines, it sells TV advertising, um, and it helps meet their bottom line. Um, to wit, those of you who are Fox News fans might not be surprised to know that there's an institutional memorandum at Fox News that when they cover climate change, their on-air personalities must, must, by policy, interject confusion and the appearance of uncertainty into that dialogue while they are on the air. That's a matter of a media corporation choosing a policy position that is at direct odds with the science. And the reason that, that we have this perception of a 50-50 argument is because very frequently they'll bring up one expert and one denier and make them face off in what appears to be an even-handed dispute. If this was a fair exchange today, I would have uh, 99 other scientists, four graduate students, two undergrads, and an elementary schooler standing on stage with me, and Dr. Hatkoff would be representing his position alone. Thank you. Next question. <coughs> yes. This is for Dr. Pauling. Um, is there any way to reverse the effects of carbon dioxide? Absolutely. And I, I want to go back. I'm going to do this with a graph again. Bear with me. So the question is, is there any way to go back, is there any way to reverse this? Can we change the, the future away from some of these really obnoxious uh, predictions? And the answer is absolutely. We know that we can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because we've seen it happen before. This cycle goes back, like I said, you can stretch this back to almost a million years. Um, you have to have plant life to do it. So the, the only mechanism, the only realistic mechanism for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere are natural forests, agricultural fields, plantations, places like this where we deliberately boost the population of plants for some other purpose that then has a, a positive impact on carbon dioxide. Could we remove all of this in enough time to avoid warming? No, we simply don't have the time. But could we start mitigating that so that we, we bring warming down to some level that's acceptable to us as a society? Absolutely. Um, and so this is why policy is important. We should be incentivizing forestry. We should be uh, helping agriculture change its land use practices because agriculture, the single largest land use in many, many counties in the United States, could emerge as the hero of this debate if they change the way they fertilize and the way they drive you know, large diesel-fired equipment. Um, there are good people working on those problems, and I'm optimistic that we have the solutions. It now is a matter of implementation. Uh, rotational gra uh, grassland for grazing for cattle and horses, but for example, drags carbon out of the air at an incredible clip. 
and sticks it in the soil. Forests we know are carbon sinks for the first 50 years of their existence and then the carbon is, is literally sequestered as a tree, right, until that tree dies and that's the century time. So we know these are good ideas. Um, and then finally, you know, before I give talks like this, I always make sure I touch base with a, you know, a climate scientist to make sure I'm not completely you know, out on a limb. Um, and I called my friend uh, Don Bosch, who's the chair of the United, uh, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science at Horn Point. Actually, Don runs all of the UMC's centers. And I asked him, I said, Don, are we, are we done? Are, is, the, is, this, are, is it too late? And he said to me, he said, well, you know, some of this is going to happen. And he said, a degree and a half, that three degrees Fahrenheit number, probably going to happen. We th all the models are telling us that. That's certain at this point. But you have to have hope. You have to think that something can be done because otherwise the costs of inaction are just not acceptable. And we know what that future might look like and we don't want to go there. So we have to think that we can do something about this. Um, on an individual scale, all sorts of stuff you can do. Um, you're, you're not going to see a huge change in your carbon footprint or your electric bill if you change all your lights to LED. I'll tell you, I've done it, right? It makes a little difference. It puts two or three dollars a month back in my pocket. At a societal scale, if we all did it, we would reduce the need for energy. We have better technology now than we did when I was a kid. We should use it, right? Um, eating is one of the biggest causes of carbon dioxide, particularly eating meat, because there's so much energy wrapped up in how we grow, process, produce, and market meat that even taking one day a week, the Meatless Monday campaign, makes a big difference in carbon footprints at the society and the community scale. Um, carpooling, driving less, taking online classes instead of coming all the way here four days a week, making sure you coordinate your drive when you go out. My mother-in-law drives me nuts. The lady is retired and can put 30,000 miles on a car in a year going from home to the store and back home and to another store and back home and then to this store and then maybe back to the store she was at in the morning to return something she's already bought and then back home again and then out for dinner and then back. 30,000 miles a year for a retiree never used to happen. My grandparents were retired, they would buy a car and in five years they'd put 12,000 miles on it because they went to the grocery store once a week and out to dinner on Sundays, right? So there are things we can and should do individually, but there are b bigger things that we can do at a societal scale. Thank you. Next question, yes. Um, Professor Farley, you said that the, if the temperature change rose above two degrees then Celsius, then it wouldn't be like super detrimental to society, but I just was looking on this website and Scott Baird, he's a professor at Columbia University and he served on the UN climate panel and studies global climate treaties. He said that if the two degree target was, he thinks it was chosen more for political reasons than for true scientific reasons. And because he thinks it was a collective target for countries to agree on, he said that if it did rise two degrees, there would, see, there would be really long droughts and intense heat waves, and there would be floods all over the coastal communities in the US. So I was just wondering if- You're correct. So her question was, um, you know, is the two degree C target really the earth that we recognize and is that really a good target or scientifically should we aim for something else? Um, there was a whole group of people in Paris when the Paris Accords were struck who were negotiating for one and a half degrees C. Um, we didn't choose one and a half degrees C because we simply don't think we can make it happen. Um, you're correct. Two degrees C is going to leave us with a world that's recognizable but there will be significant impacts. Um, the city of Miami, for example, has already spent half a billion dollars, $450 million, to install a pump system to move water out of Miami Beach and back into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the frequency of storms is still a matter of some debate in the literature, but the severity of tropical storm events is going up. That trend is both predicted and seen in the data. Um, what will probably happen globally and will certainly happen in this region is that drought cycle will get longer. Um, we see many more periods without rainfall and when we do see rainfall we expect to see more episodic deluges that you know just massive storms. Last summer here we were in the middle of a drought and we got a storm here on campus that dropped five inches in 45 minutes. Right and so yes there will be impacts like that. The thinking coming out of Paris was that those are impacts that we, we think we can mitigate for. 
Um, it's going to be really hard. Uh, Tangier Island, Deal Island, Smith Island here in the Bay, we're going to have to negotiate hard about whether we save those communities or whether we help those people relocate. Um, there are other communities that, that are going to feel the, the, the pinch for this. The, actually, of all places, or of all people, the institution that's taking this probably most seriously is the U.S. Department of Defense because they're now concerned about the viab long-term viability of Navy bases like the one in Norfolk um, and other places around the world, Pearl Harbor um, as well. So it's not a world without impacts. It's a world with impacts that we think we know how to deal with. Um, it also avoids unmitigated runaway warming, which starts to take over in the models at about 4 degrees C. And that world is not one that we probably have the ability to mitigate for all humanity. So the question is, there are some states here in the U.S. that are warm year-round, and how, do, how is climate change going to affect those states? Um, well, let's take Florida for, as, as a great example. Um, I lived in Florida for about 10 years, and so I'm reasonably familiar with the madness. Um, by the way, if y'all haven't lived in Florida, you ought to go do it for a couple of years just because it's a real zoo, right? Um, the state of Florida is going to feel the impact differently depending on which zone of Florida you're in. Um, Miami is already flooding. They've spent money not only on the South Beach project and the pumps, but they've, they're spending money to elevate roadways. Um, they are trying desperately to figure out what to do with some of their long-standing high-rise buildings in downtown Miami. Um, and they're changing building code to try and make it more, to, so that people have to build in Florida with more caution. That's a real uphill battle because Florida has always been the land of like, woo, let's build it. Well, you know, build it, they will come. Um, but along the southern coast, you know, Miami through the Florida Keys, we know we're going to see probably displacement of persons who can no longer exist, and especially Monroe County, the, the Keys and, and just above it. Um, the Everglades, we're not sure what's going to happen to the biological functions of the ecosystem in the Everglades. Tampa Bay is a flood prone area. All of those. Coastal communities along the peninsular part of Florida are worried very much about tropical storm inundation and increasing strength in tropical storms. If the models are right and the data are beginning to prove them out, we should see more Category 5 and Category 4 hurricane events. Um, Florida is simply not entirely prepared for that. And as the insurance industry pulls back, that's going to be economically a hardship that Florida is going to have to figure out how to negotiate. The panhandle of Florida, there's not so many people. Most of the population is pretty well inland. They're going to see tidal flooding on the coasts, but they're not that worried about it. Um, we, we're going to have a serious question about New Orleans and Galveston. Um, New Orleans is kind of a poster child because of what happened after Katrina. Nobody's really paying attention to Galveston, although Galveston is one of the only American cities to have taken a Category 5 storm in the teeth um, and survived. And, and they've got some good ideas, and there's people working on the question. The bigger question, I think, is um, you know, the coastal cities up and down the Atlantic seaboard, um, and that's Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, DC, Richmond, Virginia, Savannah, places like that, where we know there's going to be significant impacts. Those are not the warm places. Um, those are the, the, the coastal places. Um, places where it's really hot now, probably are going to see more warm. The, the trend of warmer summers is broadly predicted for a lot of those regions. Um, and they're going to have to figure out how to help their population manage that risk. And that's going to come at a, at a cost. That's a great question. It's also a great uh, career opportunity if you're interested in public planning, public policy. Those are really great careers coming up. So the question is, if I don't believe in global warming, what's causing more extreme weather that we're seeing? And I say that this isn't more extreme, we're just documenting it better. We are just more aware and we have our scientists who are being funded by the government, the NOAA agency, the EPA, government funded scientists who are just blowing it out of proportion. And essentially what we're looking at is sensationalized, over exaggerated claims. What my esteemed colleague just, exhi uh, just exhibited is a great example of what's called confirmation bias. I believe what I believe and the data support what I believe because I see what I'd like to believe in the data. This is what science protects us against. 
Um, you're right, there is an increase in extreme weather events and we are getting very good at the post hoc forecasting that allows us to detect the, the changes in the storm intensity events that are related to the extra energy in the atmosphere. That is, what is the climate fingerprint on any individual storm? We're not yet to the point where we can <coughs> forecast that, but we can hindcast it with some degree of confidence. Um, you're right, those are, these storms are being affected by the extra warmth in the atmosphere. Um, and to say otherwise is uh, to exist in a happy little bubble. I think, so the question is, even if I don't believe in climate change, what's the harm in going green? And I think that's a market-driven question. It, it, it lies in the economics of it, that if it's going to cost more money to go green and that you aren't doing it by choice, you're doing it because 192 nations say you have to go green, then you are losing your free choice, you're losing the free market. So that that would be a drawback. Now, should industry respond and give you a cheaper product that you choose as equal, then that's your choice. But my argument lies that it's all about you having the choice of whether you want to go green or whether you don't want to go green. And frankly, in my opinion, it doesn't matter which way you want to go. That's what America was built on. Liberty, choice. You can go whatever way you want to go as long as you're not being forced to go that direction. And if you want to buy a Hummer and get three, do three, gallon, three miles a gallon, get that RV, go across the country, go for it, because that carbon's not going to do anything to impact the planet. I humbly submit that my opponent is, again, living in his happy little bubble, uh, where all of us have absolutely equal choice under an unfettered and a completely free marketplace. Um, that simply doesn't exist. I, I don't know about y'all, but I can't afford an RV. Um, and if gas goes to $4 a gallon, I'm looking for ways to telecommute instead of to commute uh, using my ordinary vehicle. Um, and I'm going to point out that uh, there are economic benefits to doing this. Um, for example, two years ago I'd have told you that the solar industry created more jobs than the oil industry lost. This year, that statistic appears to be that the solar industry has created more jobs than exist in the oil industry. Right? So there are economic benefits to renewable energy. There are economic benefits to wind and solar. Um, organic produce is now a $5.5 billion a year business and it continues to grow. So there are market sectors at play here. Absolutely, there are market questions and behaviors of individuals at play. But in my experience, incentivizing that market to move towards things that are not destructive to the planet can be both good for the planet and good for the economy. And I think there's a lot of good evidence to show that. Good. So the question is, uh, do I support uh, decarbonizing transportation, going for higher gas mileage, or uh, transitioning to electric vehicles? And if so, what's the likely impact of all that? Um, there are a bunch of questions in there, and uh, just to try and detangle briefly. Um, yes, by and large, uh, gas mileage is good. Right? Higher gas mileage is better. Um, and that's both at an industrial scale and at an individual scale. Right? If you have a car that gets eight miles to the gallon, you're paying a lot more for gas, and that's some fraction of your paycheck you could be using for something else. Um, I owned a Prius for a while. Right? 53 miles to the gallon felt really, really good. Um, I went to the gas station about once every 20, 10 or 12 days, and when I filled up, it cost me like 10 bucks, and I could go 400 miles on that. Um, and this was from a guy who for a while drove a, a 1996 Ford Ranger pickup truck at 12 miles to the gallon. Right? So um, gas mileage, I'm, I'm in favor of gas mileage standards for vehicles, not only because of their benefits for the environment, which are documentable and significant, um, but also for personal reasons. Electric vehicles, just they, they don't even move the needle. You have to switch gauges, right? Um, true cost to own on electric vehicles is really, really low because there is no maintenance, there's no oil changes, there's no fluids, there's no fan belts. It's a, it's a very simple way to build a vehicle. You get more miles per watt 
out of electricity than you do out of per watt per gasoline because you don't waste the energy as heat. Um, and I think as the infrastructure comes on, those factors, although the initial purchase price is higher, consumers will begin to adopt those. They can see that the lifetime of the vehicle is going to cost them less than it does to drive an internal combustion engine going forward. Um, I think we're not there yet. I think the infrastructure, people still have questions about range and they still have questions about where to charge and how long it takes. Um, but there's good people working on those problems as well. So by and large, yes, I'm all in favor. And this is coming from a guy who's a, a, a dyed-in-the-wool car nut, right? I mean, I spent the 80s drooling over Ferraris, um, which I'll never be able to own. They don't let my people near Ferraris. Um, and I appreciate a good muscle car, and I appreciate a good drag race. And, and I'm not a NASCAR fan because there's just a little bit too much redneck going on there. But, um, you know, F1, um, using racing to develop some of this technology is really exciting. Um, and my hope is, is that the, the racing community develops the technologies we all need. Um, and by way of evidence, the Nissan Motorsport Group last year ran a car. They ran an electric vehicle in the 24 hours of Le Mans using induction charging. They never had to plug the car in. And they ran the car for 24 straight hours on a battery. The future is here, guys. It's really exciting. So the question is basically, do I not think that the economy will be affected by the sea level rise? Well, that is a loaded question because I don't think the sea level is going to rise. I think what we're looking at is temporal sort of short-term anomalies that are being extrapolated out to the long term. So I'm not even worried about that. And the big businesses that may be on the coast, they can pick up. They can move, they can set their business down somewhere else if they're really worried. They've got the money to do that and the workers can follow because workers will always follow their jobs. I disagree. I disagree for a number of reasons. Um, the unfortunate part about my colleague's argument is that the costs of mitigation, the way we currently structure the sort of what happens to businesses and economies is that the costs are all local. The causes here are global, um, but you and I are not paying for Miami Beach, right? That's being borne by the taxpayers of Miami. Um, and so if we continue to deny the problem at a global scale, then we continue to pass costs along to people who have the unfortunate happenstance to live in seaward communities and, and places where this is going to be more problematic. Um, companies have the resources to pick up and move. Individuals don't, always. Um, and I think that's a completely fallacious argument. Um, yeah, I, I think the denial of the problem simply passes the cost along to somebody else who's got to pay for it. And that's good for you if you live in Iowa. So basically, about deregulation, when it, go, when it goes wrong, what do I think about that? Well, I think the businesses will sort it out. That's what they're best at. We shouldn't impose, and I don't think that it's the U.S. government. The U.S. government has a role to play. My major problem is when the world government, the 192 nations, try to impose economic tariffs, taxes upon individual countries, Whereas it's not something that you or I or anybody here voted for or any of our elected representatives voted for, but something that's imposed. So I'm not for total deregulation. I'm for a decrease in regulation so that you all don't have to pay extra taxes and so that it's something that we decide as a country, not something that's decided on an arbitrary fact of two degrees Celsius and carbon dioxide. In rebuttal, I'd offer this. You have seen deregulated industry continue to choose the wrong procedures, the wrong processes, and the wrong outcomes. 
Here in the Chesapeake Bay, the agriculture and poultry industries have, for much of the last half century, chosen to maximize profits while using the Chesapeake Bay as an open sewer. These are strong words. I realize they'd make some people angry. But the outcomes of that have been economic losses in the tourism industry, economic losses in the shellfish and finfish industries, slides and declines in property value, and a long-term state-by-state battle to try and clean up waters that are connected across six states and the District of Columbia that was, uh, the only word for it is an epic fail. Deregulate, continued deregulation in that industry would make the bay unrecoverable by some estimates. It was only a lawsuit to force EPA to obey its own law, its own policy, and force regulation to clean up the Chesapeake Bay that is causing what minor turnarounds we are now celebrating. Deregulation is, I humbly submit to you, it's a myth. I don't think it works the way economic free market pure thinkers think it does. And I think the evidence supports that. Next question. Any group not get their second question in? Small aside for a minute. Great questions, y'all. Really well done. Do I have any other questions? Okay. Um, I may not say this very well because I've been trying to, this whole time, trying to figure out how to ask. But um, this is for Dr. Hackoff again. Um, so you referred to a time when the earth was um, just as hot and if not hotter. Yes. Um, So when the earth was just, when the earth was hotter, when I was referring to four degrees warmer. N no. <laughs> okay, so then, follow-up question. So, is that, should we really use that as a base of really just not worrying about our future? I mean, if no humans existed during that time, can we really know what the effect would be of two degrees warmer, three degrees warmer, or four or more? I would, I would say that evol uh, environmental changes spur evolution. So we would evolve and we would adapt and we are smart and have brains and can come up with machines and technologies to protect ourselves. So most of us could die, but some of us will survive and survive all the fittest and we'll move on to the next. That, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how it's been on this planet for billions of years and that's how we'll keep going. Malthus was right. Yes. Do you actually believe what you said? <laughs> <laughs> I think that brings us very nicely to the. To be a conservative. I I I have no political. I have no political affiliation. I am simply stating facts that oppose climate change. Do any other questions guys? Okay. Thank you. So each speaker gets two minutes to wrap up their their debate. Um, so, Professor Farley, you have the closing statements first. I'll try and keep myself to my two minutes. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for paying attention. Great questions. Thank you all for being interested enough to ask those questions. Um, these things I know to be true. We can measure the changes happening in our climate. We can see the impacts happening. We have the responsibility to deal with those facts in an, uh, in an adult fashion society-wide. That is, to continue to deny this is just simply not good policy. We are at a critical point. We can get a handle on this. We've got about 10 years, so the models tell us, to uh, get, a, get a, a, a handle on our carbon emissions, to decarbonize some sectors of our economy, to amplify the role for agriculture and forestry in being part of the solution. Um, we are going to need all hands on deck to do this. Um, we have always been, as my colleague points out, an industrial society. We built the American economy first on the back of a chattel slavery system in the south and then on the backs of the coal miners. It is time for another massive and fundamental shift in the way Americans perceive our productivity. We no longer have the luxury of extracting mass, our massive reserves. We no longer have the, the luxury of viewing 
the growth in GDP as a function of fossil fuel. We can still grow the economy, we can still be strong, we can still be a world leader. We need to step up and embrace that role. If we don't, the future will bring challenges that we are not prepared to address. And you're right, humanity will survive this. But not all of us can afford to ride the rocket ship. Not all of us can afford to move. Not all of us are going to be able to afford to, to take on the technology that's going to be necessary to live in that world. We have a chance to do this. We have a chance to do it the right way. We need to pay attention to the data and we need to treat it with respect and we need to have a, a national dialogue in, including conservatives and liberals about what to do in terms of policy to try and constrain this future to something we like. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hackoff, in closing. So in closing, basically I would like to just summarize all the facts that I've been letting you know that fundamentally this seems like an over-exaggerated claim that in previous pop literature that there had been claims going the opposite direction, the Time Magazine piece. That there are certain undeniable facts that yes, in 1816 it was a year without a summer, that the climate does change, that the planet has been this hot and this cold before, and that 100% of scientists are not in agreement whether climate change is happening, and if they do think it's happening, they're not in agreement necessarily on the mechanism that is causing it. The over-exaggerated claims are designed to essentially allow for regulations that the Paris Accords have chosen the arbitrary two degree mark as the spot that they deem as the section that we need to stick to. And I essentially submit that this is just the scientists, the governments trying to essentially scare everyone into regulations that are unnecessary and that this is a natural phenomena that the earth is, is simply seeing a slight uptick and maybe all the natural phenomena coming together and that this isn't an issue that we need to be worried about for our future. Thank you. Thank you, debaters. Let's give a round of applause. Dr. Hatchoff, good job. So guys, today, the point of the exercise was in last week, I gave you articles to read and you guys fact checked. Remember, we looked at, at cancer treatment. Today, the exercise was in you hearing two different arguments coming at you. Because this is, this is what we deal with all the time. We turn the news on. And the arguments can be about anything. And so the challenge today was for you guys to have to hear it and fact check it while not having the written argument right in front of you. So this was an exercise in listening to that and picking out pieces that you could fact check you know, getting through the emotions and stuff like that and finding specific things you could ask about in the arguments. I think you guys did great. I love the questions you asked. Gentlemen, do you have anything you would like to say to help I mean, today's exercise? Basically, I, I'm obviously, I'm on Professor Farley's side, I'm on Greg's side with this one. Um, but everything that I've said is an argument that's been said before. None of this is something that I made up. It's something that's been put on the news, put in books, yes? I mean, it's kind of obvious you're trying to make the other side look bad. I'm not trying to make them look bad. I'm using their words. Actually, that's, we designed the exercise that way yeah. so that we could expose what the, the argument and the rhetorical well, tactics are. More or less um, to, you know, agreeing, but trying to push your narrative to make the other side look bad, but without a fair argument from somebody who actually believes it. These, I, I, these are their arguments. I was going to say, respectfully, this is, this is the argument against. That we, we, we did the research. Well, you can, we, we, I'm open, as a scientist, I must be open to the possibility that I'm wrong. But you would need to bring data in a commensurate fashion, peer reviewed, in a commensurate quantity that would force me to reconsider the conclusions that the rest of the scientific community has come to. I'm open to that. <coughs> but when you watch this happen in the public sphere, this is, Dr. Hadkoff's position is what happens. There's a lot of name calling and there's a lot of red herrings and there's a lot of cherry picked data. There are a lot of individual instances. I don't mean to interrupt, but you, Andrew, you 
saying that gives me an idea that I would love for you guys to do on what you're turning in on Canvas. We all watch the news. We hear arguments from both sides. I would love it if you guys would just do some bullet points of some arguments that you've heard. Recently, I heard the CNN uh, debate where um, it was William Happer, he was uh, the opposing view. He made the same argument that Dr. Hatkoff did about we all breathe out two pounds of carbon dioxide. So if you've heard of something recently, put that, put that on the thing. You're going to submit, submit Canvas. And we can grow the arguments that we're pulling from to, to design the exercise. So share what you, share what you know. If, I'm not going to grade it if you don't put that part in there. I will grade it if you don't turn in what was assigned. That you will get graded. Um, but if you, if you want to share some arguments and viewpoints that you have recently, do that. Do that. I would be interested in reading them. Can I lay one more graph on you guys? Because it didn't make it into the talk today, but I, it's a really interesting one. You have 30 seconds, right? So this is Bloomberg, right? So it's a news organization. They decided they were going to answer this question. Their, their, concerned, their concern mostly is about the business community, right? The Bloomberg News Network is about, is about building trust with the business community. They went to the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies data and tried to answer a number of questions which do form the backbone of a lot of the denialist argument, right? Um, so watch this. We argued about changes in the Earth's orbit, right? We can measure those. We can measure the changes in solar insulation in watts per meter squared of the atmosphere, right? Given wobble in the Earth's orbit. And you can see that there are places where that's stronger and places where it's weaker. It doesn't really explain the observed warming trend. We also measure changes in solar output, which I think is another ar argument that Matt put up, right? And that there are peaks and there are valleys. There is some sort of variation in that system. It also doesn't explain the trends we see. We looked at volcanoes. Volcanoes are responsible primarily for cooling, right? 1800 and froze to death, or a year without a winter, right? It was a massive volcanic event. And we had a student earlier in the week who actually fact checked that while we were on the fly, and she found the, the data for that. Volcanoes are responsible for, I mean, look at this, it's a really nice pattern. There's a dip, there's a massive volcanic activity, and there's a dip in the global temperature record, global uh, volcanic explosion, dip in the temperature record. That's a cooling forcing. Because it radiates the solar, it basically bounces the solar radiation back into space before it can get trapped by the carbon dioxide, or right. some of it can be trapped by the carbon dioxide. It acts as a giant umbrella. It's a nuclear winter argument. All three of those things combined, put them all together, and they still don't explain what's what the forcing is in the temperature. We were worried for a long time that deforestation was contributing, and it looks like land use patterns, especially the growth in agricultural land globally, is actually part of the solution. That's a, that's a cooling mechanism, not a warming mechanism. Um, ozone pollution, what's, what does ozone have to do with this? It's a minor warming forcer. It does, you notice that this is all kind of above the line here. Lots of variation, but above the mean. So it's contributing a little bit, but it doesn't explain the... The, the system itself. Aerosols or any small particles in the atmosphere actually help cool. So smog, believe it or not, is a good thing because smog represents uh, small particles of stuff in the air that help reflect sunlight back out to the, like a, beyond the atmosphere. Terrible human health impacts, don't get me wrong, right? But smog actually cools stuff. You put all those together, you still don't have it. The only thing that explains this is the forcing that is primarily carbon dioxide and along with that methane and nitrous oxide and some other gases. Right? These all represented valid scientific ideas 20 and, 20 and more years ago. They all represented things we needed to understand to really understand this system well. And if you watch the, the, the no side of this debate, Sometimes they are leaning on very old arguments that have been systematically and scientifically disproven, right? Which is what science does, right? If you add all the four things up together, right, the combination of that, you see the very end of that? Can I rerun that? Watch what happens at the end here, right? 
Greenhouse gases would actually have us warming above this line, but all the cooling influences, the volcanoes and the smog and all the rest of that, are what bring the, the curve down to the temperature record down to where we see it. Right, so it's a system. That's the other thing that the denialist camp, I think, often gets wrong. And I would encourage you to take this into science elsewhere, too. When you're looking for a single axis driver of a complex system, you will almost always be inaccurate in some way. Right? Atmosphere is a complex global system, and there are multiple, multiple, multiple drivers in there. Right? So we've tried to represent both sides of this very fairly. Um, we've tried to, we actually, the Heartland Institute, is a uh, conservative free market economic think tank. They send out a global warming isn't happening packet to every science teacher in the K-12 system in the US every couple of years. They sent it to us this year. We used it as material to, to build Dr. Hatkoff's side of the case. So we're not making this up, right? This is, you know, we're working on as close to the primary documents as you can get in this case. What was that agency called again? It's called the Heartland Institute. They're responsible for some really fun PR tricks, like they hang billboards with a picture of the Unabomber that says he still believes in global warming, why do you? Um, but they hold a conference every year on why this isn't happening. Um, they push out a lot of literature about why this isn't happening. Um, their money, if you, follow, if you play follow the money with their funding, there's a lot of oil company money that comes into that. Less so now than there has been in the past because uh, oil companies are beginning to get out ahead of this. ExxonMobil apparently had a research division from 1970s on forward trying to figure out what was going on with the atmosphere, how they were contributing to it, and what this meant for them economically going forward. Um, they then buried all of that and didn't tell us about it, but they were on it. Um, British Petroleum, BP, has said they want to be an energy company, not an oil company by 2100. Um, so there are shifts in that industry as well. So, um, you know, we've, we, I, we've tried to be fair. I'm running over time, aren't I? Well, I was going to say, since you, since you mentioned Heartland, did you share the page that showed the Republican think tank yes. that's yeah. pro-climate change for those if you want to yes. see a different... The science behind point. climate change isn't politicized. Where the political conversation has to take place is now. Now that we have the data that support climate change, then we put this into the political arena. And there's no right or wrong answer necessarily with a political question, but the conversation has to start to take place. And that's the most important thing. And then you have the Republicans like this that are coming out who say, okay, we see the facts, we understand it. Let's get in front of this. Let's have the conversation. Let's figure out how to best address this in the best way possible. And even in the current Congress, which is probably the most polarized one that we have, on, at least on the century time span, with, within our own government, um, there is a Republican Climate Congress action group in the House it's being led by the guy who's the representative from Miami. Um, and in an interview, I, it was actually really interesting, he's not convinced at all by the data. What convinced him was one of his constituents who came to him and said, I can no longer get my trash collected when the tide is high. And when the tide is high, I can't get out of my driveway and go to my job. So at some level, the conversation probably needs to move out of what I've presented. The data are only good for so many people, right? And we need to start telling the stories of how this is happening. And because that's what's going to drive policy at a local and regional and, and hopefully even a global scale. And it's a global problem, guys. What goes on in China affects us here. Thank you. And thank you, guys. Again, I want to give a round of applause to y'all for your questions. Good job. Yeah, you guys, I think those are some of the best questions I've seen all week. Hey, guys. Well done, y'all. Good job. Good work. Don't forget good to questions. Come